I'm sorry, Jim, go ahead. ahead. We have two phones, so we're, we're doing Facebook Live right now and Instagram Live. Okay, excellent. I was just going to go to my phone and connect it up. I'm so sorry, Jim, go ahead. For example, in the Catholic, um, contemporary Catholic, uh, I don't know if the is the right word, uh, this idea of uh, seamless, seamless God, right? They want to protect the unborn child, but they also want to protect the born child. They also want people to have a home, uh, food. You know, it's, it's, it's a real sense of uh, full, We'll stack of human rights. So you're saying God has a set of opinions about what man should do? I think that uh, we uh, derive a sense of uh, some sort of sense of moral, moral code, etc. You know, it comes down from you know the interaction through religion with a godlike person or persons. You know, I know that you know you're into some of the African religions. I mean, you don't talk about God for about God. Right? We go back to Greek gods, you know. So already we're that's we actually not true, but I'll get to that. Okay. So we, we have like really different discourse. We want to talk about God, we want to talk about the world with you know, many gods, you know. And those many gods are much more like us than that mysterious God up there who has the gate to heaven in his hand or her. Um, Anyway, um, so but anyway, I, I I sometimes will facetiously say I, I'm not a believer, but I believe in believing. Mm -hmm. And other people have said this before me. You know, I, I admire people of faith, mm -hmm. especially when you get something like the Catholic Workers Movement. You get people like that. You know, they're like they're my heroes. Mm -hmm. I wish I had that much faith. 
pretty simple, right? So uh, I would say that in God we would find hopefully morality and faith. So so morality, you know, on which of course varies from place to place, you know. Um, but you feel that it is always an emanation of God, whatever morality you find. Um, well, that's as you know, I, I'm not, I don't think there is a God sitting up there, but I think that we, we, we develop morals, and then we try to find an excuse. Ah, <laughs> uh, so, so God's an excuse for I our own beliefs. Yeah, but I'm, I mean in a positive sense, not in a positive sense. I'm not saying anything. I think that I think every society involves some sort of moral code. And usually, what we think of as a moral code is usually a positive moral what code. What I find interesting though is that you're saying that we create God rather than God creates us. Is that something you believe? Uh, I wouldn't say that absolutely, but I think it's. I, well, I'm much more of a phenomenologist. We create the world, and if God is part of the world, then we create the God too. I mean, my religion, if I have one, is a phenomenological that's, you know, that's, that's stance cool. that's, that's, that's real. That's what I'm trying to get at. Is to try to speak as factually as you can from your own experience. You know what I'm saying? To, to really, you know, try to be detailed and specific, like, like a mathematical equation about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, what about what about yourself, Jimmy? Uh, uh, as you know, I grew up with an atheist father, um, went to Quaker church once in a while with my grandmother, so that word God always connotes to me, um, you know, Adam, the Michelangelo, Sistine Chapel, you know, God reaches out, God, yeah, God, 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 and, uh, you know, being and that I, that's a lot. growing up believing in Santa Claus, I think of Santa Claus as being God, Creator creates joy for all the children, and they gladly receive his offerings. Um, but now that I've been exposed to uh, alternative uh, beliefs and, and views, um, the Bible, but I, I believe it begins, it says first there was the Word, right? So for me, that's enough. Take the Word. Whatever that word is, yeah, that is God. Um, but also at the same time, not God, it's also God. Well, well, a loss of word. It's interesting God. that you say the word, just simply the word. Because the word, us being in digital age, we understand that the word is just information. Right. You know I mean? Right, it could be a zero or a one or a, yeah. It's just information. I mean, my has words and those words are information. And even our body uses proteins as words and, and you know other molecules. Right. You know, but it's interesting that sorry to interrupt oh, cool. uh, but this discussion about uh, seeing something in a positive way or a negative way, that's something I'm trying to understand. Like like positive and negative why you know, for an electrical charge to travel from positive to negative, they have to be equal. They can't have one over another. Actually, they have to be unbalanced. There has to be more negativity here and more positivity there in order to go Okay. But this idea of um, energy traveling from chaotic state to crystalline state back again. Um, you know, I find that really interesting that, that our culture puts uh, so much emphasis on one aspect, the crystalline. You know, people, I think, often associate that with God. The chaos, I feel, is also um, the light. You know, when you die, you go into the light. But, you know. How would you describe the crystalline state? Um, Order the state? And you need a state that has a pattern. Yeah. And you should describe the chaotic state as a state in which there's no apparent pattern. Right. Okay. Yeah. Do you feel that um, um, our idea of good and evil has to do with the availability of patterns and the lack of patterns? Perhaps. I mean, I think. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. 
same point. So I think, um, you know, that's one thing I think we do as human beings, and, and that's how we're designed to recognize patterns. And, um, and I think it uh, creates stereotypes, it creates racism. Um, you know, when I'm driving, the driver pisses me off. I naturally see who's at the wheel so I can, like, figure out, you know, what the system is that makes somebody a bad driver. Is it a woman? Is it a man? Is that New Jersey plates? You know? <laughs> um, it's interesting. I mean, um, the, the language that's most in depth at describing patterns is uh, mathematics. Mm -hmm. And they often say mathematics has no emotional expression. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. But you're saying that your emotions can look like a place. There are certain factors that you want to add about and putting together to determine what emotional response you have. Mm -hmm. um, what about yourself? Silence is something I would uh, meditate on, but uh, me personally, I believe in a, some kind of source that is a source of everything. And everything that we can later on argue about, which is good or bad, or black or white, or up or down. It's just like a source of everything, and uh, and it's for me it's uh, more like a process or a verb than a figure, a thing, or something. Mm -hmm. It's more like experience than uh, anything else. Like uh, experiencing life is God. Being alive is God. Being dead is God. Mm. Uh, it's, it, would, you, would you say that the concept of God is a limitless being? 
Well, uh, no. infinite, maybe, yeah. So you wouldn't put any limits on it. That is you, that is Floyd, that is everything. It's just... Yeah, more like pantheistic, I think. Uh, it's close to me. And uh, this kind of concept. And... Uh, mm, I would say energy. Energy. Exhibition space Brooklyn? I think it's a, a completely simple Or it's an old one. Yeah, that's all. And mm. as much as you could look at that picture there and say, that's really, really good. It's wonderful. There's an angel and it's from beautiful water and um, the sky and the spirit. It's just fantastic. It's really good. Okay, the next person comes and says, that's evil. There's, that, that, that's a symbol. There, there, that's evil. That, that, that represents the worst connotation of mankind. And the water, it's dirty water, and it's filthy, and it's horrible, and it's full of evil. So, you feel so one uh, person A says good, person B says it's bad. Person A says. So you feel good and evil is absolutely relative, but God is above that. Well, well that's, that's another question. That's, a, no, that's another okay. question. That's another question. Um, when I was growing up in Brooklyn, um, the five percent of us about eight years old, he said, "I want to know what this mysterious God is," and I am sure that you all are God. Each one of you is God, right. and I want to know what divine attributes you can. To this mysterious God that you are. The mysterious God really um, is the biblical God, you know, the Judeo Christian God, um, the Judeo Christian Islamic God. Um, and his questions, his questions, and how we went about asking this about the divine attributes of God were different than. Christian mysterious God because he was right off the bat saying that us as black people we were God that just the fact that we were black people we were God and part of his whole philosophy was that all um, European Americans white folk were the devil but as we were in cipher me and my friends started to define our own ideas of what God was. And um, we would 
arguing back and forth about what divine attributes does God have. You know, cats would say God is magnetic. You're always attracted to God. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of the things that I felt, because um, I've been thinking about that for a long time. My father said that when I was five years old, I asked him if Superman was God. And you know, him being a black national, I'm sure he got very upset about me asking whether this white character was God. <laughs> you know? But the way they spoke about God in the church, the Southern Baptist Church I went to, it sounded like Superman. You know, somebody that sweep in and save you and and you know take care of all the demons for you, you know what I'm saying? Um I didn't no, think that was God. I, I, in fact, because of the only thing he insisted on is that the white man was the devil and that the black man was God. Other than that, whatever the definition he had for God was cool. But I wasn't cool with the idea of white man being the devil. You know? Um, I had issues with that. Um, I had issues with the concept of the devil, period. Because I felt that God was good and there's nothing going on here but God. Oh, my definition for God, my divine attribute for God ended up being that God is solid. That, that, that God is solid and we are all, we are all in God. But because we are not God, we see all the different things we see. If God, God exists at, in, in, on a plane where there's no difference between me, you, and the air, and the void of space, and the stars, I felt that God was just a whole thing, period. Oh man, solid because it didn't recognize any differences. Um, so that's where I got my name, Solid Soul. Um, and then I went around looking for a book or anybody that was talking about this notion of God. And my mom, she was studying to get her master's in English. So she had all these wonderful books I read. Don Juan, Carlos Castaneda, um, I read um, Nietzsche, Good and Evil. I mean, I was 11, 12 years old, but, you know, I understand this, thus spoke Zazusas, because it was Superman. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was, it was the Uberman. You know, it made perfect sense to me. You know? I said, that shit, I rejected it when I was five. <laughs> you know? So I kept looking for anyone that was going to say that God could not be opposed, had, um, was beyond good and evil, that there's only one thing going on here, nothing else but God. And oh, the closest I got at that time was a book by Herman Hess. Herman Hess wrote this book called Damien. And in Damien, I, I picked it up at my mom's library thinking it was about, you know, because it was the 70s, so I thought it was about the omen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But actually it was about the Gnostics. And the Gnostics were an animist sect of Christianity. Now, theology and animism are two different models for God. Theology believes that God is separate from creation and acts upon creation. So God, separate from creation, created creation, and then acts upon his creation, but is not his creation. He, two different things. Animism, on the other hand, believes that all things are animated with God. All things, everything is, is God's spirit. You know what I'm saying? So that was right there. I was like, oh boy, it taught my game. God's everywhere, God's everything. One solid God. And 
as I read this book about the Gnostics, they said that the Gnostic name for God, the true God, which is, which was, I mean, the book blew my mind. It's, you know, I didn't know there could be any God other than the God that said, let there be light, and the potter that sculpted all human beings. But here we have the set of Christians that were early Christians. The Gnostics were before the Catholic Church, before all that stuff, and they believed that God, Jehovah, was the false God. That he had usurped the body of the true God to create creation. So, this idea went kind of like this. Abraxas. Abraxas was the name of the true God. I looked it up later and I saw it could be stuck in brass axe. So I got soul's axe from this, you know, brass axe, soul's axe. Um, Abraxas, also the Carlos Santana album, he got that from the same book, Damien. Um, Abraxas is a Greek word, and in Greek letters, just like in um, um, Hebrew letters, Oh, the letters are both letters and numbers. So Abraxas adds up to 365. The reason why this was so important to the Gnostics is because they believed that God was time itself. And that God expressed itself in the eternal year. And what is the eternal year? The echo of let there be light. Let there be light echoes 365 times, and then it echoes evermore for years and years and years. They believe that each one of those echoes, each day in the eternal year, the eternal cycle of being, each day was an angel of God. And they believe that Obatala, excuse me, <laughs> jumping ahead. They believe that Jehovah was the first day, and he chose to take over right then <laughs> and, and start shaping God into his image. You get what I'm saying? So their whole idea was that Christ was trying to get behind Jehovah was trying to get behind, beyond Elohim, was trying to get beyond the Creator to the true God, which was creation itself. All right, so the Gnostic Bumi, wow, that's really close to what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? And I went on with the Gnostics for a long time as it being my central thing. I, of course, learned about many other cultures, many other religions, but my basic model for God was that Gnostic idea of Abraxas. Then I was lucky enough, after I returned from Europe, oh, in my second year of college, um, in, the, in my third year of college, I was finally able to take a class on African culture and history. Um, and I started to learn about sub-Saharan culture. Sub-Saharan culture, well, the first book that I read out of, um, the first book that I read for the class, I went to Caribbean Cultural Center. And, um, because the person who was teaching the class, um, um, How is it? Professor Wilder, mm -hmm. my chair, Professor Wilder, um, he, he, he suggested for us to read Robert Curtis Thompson. And he told us Robert Curtis Thompson in his uh, academic, old school, yearly, probably had access to set all the slaves, but he was the utmost expert and should read his book, Flash the Spirit. And me coming up with my you know, background, I was like, I'm not going to read first thing. 
this white male they told me about. Let me go, and I went to Caribbean Cultural Center, and they told me about this book on Orisha, the New World Black Goddesses. Well, there's one information about them out here. Oh, the book, the book, as I, as I read it, I, I, I felt blown away because it's basically everything I was looking for in my mom's library, every Buddhist and, and life, Jewish temple I went to, every Christian church I went to, every Hindu spot I went to, looking for something that matched my mom. Oh, it was first. If I had seen this book first, I would have been like, just a second, to New York. Um, and they did have, their, like I said before, Obatala is the Yoruba name for Elohim, the creator, um, the light. Uh, there you go. Hey. Hey, nice to see you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so, let me write that down, because I want you all to feel free, I want you all to feel free to look, to look up, to look up this stuff. Olo Dumara, Olo Dumara, Olo is a very important, Olo is a very important prefix. Olo, Olo means um, to own. In fact, O in general means to own. So when you look at the Big Bang, 
you are looking at all of us. Everything we've ever known, everything we've ever seen, everything that could ever possibly be, everything that ever possibly was, all in one place at one time. And I want to say one place at one time, but the fact of the matter is, is that there is no time and place when everything is at one. In order to have time and place, you have to have at least two things. You have to have one thing looking at another thing, which implies you have to have a third thing, the place in which the two things are looking at each other. And that's Odu. Odu is the place where everything happens. Odu is the place where relatives within the singularity can see each other, can move around each other. It is the ultimate meaning. The only meaning in a singularity, the only way you can see difference is by being one place and seeing another place. Odu is place. You get what I'm saying? Mare, 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 yorba, the yorba word of the scientists. Because mare is a really deep scientific concept. Mare really simply is this. Really, really, to be honest, it's this. Well, it's a whole bunch of snakes. <laughs> snakes and chains. Basically. Mare, mare is frequency. Mare is the fact that something is turning, is moving. My voice has a frequency. Oh, the light has a frequency. Oh, Mare is the way in which subatomic particles express themselves. And we are all made of subatomic particles. You know, <clears throat> the thing that I really appreciate about Yoruba philosophy is that they're very intent on looking at what is the lowest common denominator. What is the simplest way that you can talk about a characteristic that is pleasant in everything you experience? And these are the two characteristics that they felt are the fundamental characteristics of time and space itself. The singularity and mara. The singularity is where mara propagates. Without odu, there is no mara. Without mara, there is nothing going on in odu. You get what I'm saying? So this combination of things is the simplest way of describing everything that could ever possibly be their experience. Everything has these two things in common, usually deeply intertwined. So, <clears throat> Olu Dumari, the singularity and the frequency, the frequency is always a spectrum. Once you have one frequency, just one frequency, it means you have innumerable frequencies. And they all have innumerable relationships with each other. You know what I'm saying? So the, um, the rainbow is, is a spectrum. The musical scale is a spectrum. Oh, humanity is a spectrum. You can put all of us by our skin tone in, and we make a perfect spectrum, just moving from one side to the other. Oh, temperature is a spectrum. Oh, time is a spectrum. Time, and all of these things are produced by Mara. Time, you keep time, 
by keeping time, you are producing knowledge. When we talk about day and night, that is a frequency of 365 times a year. That's mare. Mare are the way in which the angels were born. Oludumare never had to be born. Oludumare never had to be created. Oludumare actually is going on right now. The Big Bang is banging right now. We are all still in the singularity for all intents and purposes. Since the beginning of time and space till the end of time and space, the singularity will always simply be the singularity. Time and space is just something we experience because the singularity produced angels that allow us to experience time and space. And it's very complicated how these angels did that. <laughs> it is, there's, there's no joke about it. It's, it's scientific. Um, Hawkins, God bless his soul, he passed away before he could figure it all out. Um, Einstein was all upset about it. It's, it's a very complicated issue how we get from the singularity to people and cities and earth and stars, very complicated. <laughs> but I'm going to try to skip a couple of the shady points because I got it, because I don't know. <laughs> but I'll try to talk about what I do know. Right? The singularity as it expanded was all the time and all the space and all the energy that ever could or ever would be. And it was crystal, at least according to the theories that are being propagated right now. They believe that the singularity had on a quantum level a symmetricity. That symmetricity was matter and antimatter. They both were in complete peace with each other. Or they both were in complete war with each other. You can see it either way. The fact of the matter is, is that our whole universe as we know it was produced because for as far as we can see in our place of it, there was just a little bit more matter than there was antimatter. And when I say a little bit more, I mean decimals, you know? Very little matter survived when antimatter and matter negated each other. In a sense, because like I said, the Big Bang is still banging, in a sense, we may not even really exist. You know, in a sense, everything that doesn't exist really does exist. Because that super symmetrical singularity can still be going on right now and we just aren't aware of it because of the frequency of matter that we are. So that's, that's a whole other thing. The bottom line is, is that this little bit of matter survived this horrendous planet kismic peace of war. This little bit of matter has all of that pain and all of that love and all of that peace and all of those emotions. That's the thing that gets me sad about scientists is that they don't consider the emotional expression of what they're observing. You know what I'm saying? To, 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 to be either antimatter or matter, just the idea of so much of what you are to never be expressed in time and space as far as we know. That's, um, I mean, breathtaking. It's like on day one going through genocide. You know what I'm saying? Or on day one being able to save your precious little child while your whole civilization is destroyed. In any case, whatever analogy you want to put on it, they all fit. It all makes sense. As 
the matter that was left over started to expand. It wasn't matter at all. It was energy. Um, that energy, the primal energy, that is where we get another Yoruba word. Eshu Aleba. Eshu Aleba. Eshu means literally the force that gathers things into balls. So really, you can make an argument that Eshu is all over the mark because we think of the singularity as a ball. But remember, only Gemara has no place for that ball to be. So therefore, it can't be a ball. Whatever, whatever. You don't like to talk about all the Gemara's. Ah, <laughs> you know, too much. But you can talk about Eshu, because Eshu exists inside of Odu. Once you have Odu, Odu at once was one thing. When that energy canceled out, the, the, the anti-energy was canceled out, and you were left nothing but matter energy. That matter energy was one thing inside of one space. And it expanded. And as it expanded, it took on the form of the antimatter matter um, collision, our peace, our marriage, our, our war, or whatever. The th at that time, the, the form was like a web, mara. It was these intertangled chains caused by some places being caused by um, caused by the antimatter and the matter fighting with each other. I have a question. Yeah. So SU is the force that binds into balls, right? Mm -hmm. um, what caused the expansion? All right. Um, the expansion was Chango. Um, Chango is um, another angel in the Yoruba pantheon. I don't want to talk about Chango just yet, um, but um, because when I say Chango, I might as well be saying Oluwa in this case, um, because it was so early that what you really have is the expansion of Odu rather than the expansion of any one thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, the first thing that happened as, 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 as Odu expanded, let's put it like that, because it wasn't really talking about it. Right? Odu is a female Orisha, by the way, you know, just to make that clear. Um, female, um, all, all mediums are considered women because men come out of the medium of women. You know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, um, a leg bar dances in a surf. The first thing that happened as the primal energy expanded is that the energy started to spin in circles on very, very, on the quantum level, on such a small scale. These balls of energy, these balls of mara, these balls of mara had a specific spin. They were called quarks. And they were the first balls that Eshu, the force that gathers things into balls, makes. The quarks have different spins, upside, down, whatever. It isn't, it isn't that important. But the important thing is that Eshu, whose signature 
And again, signatures are so important. Eshu, whose signature is the number three. Eshu took those balls and bound them three together. And depending on what spins the balls had, they either became protons or neutrons. So Eshu pulled the primal energy together, the original energy together, to make um, um, quarks. Those quarks were pulled together to make protons and neutrons. Once the quarks were pulled together to make protons and neutrons, something powerful happened. A new Orisha, well, several new Orishas were born. Several new angelic characteristics were born. Origin of Elohim. When Eshu brought the protons and neutrons together, let's say this is a, um, a, a proton. The proton immediately pulled light out of the mind. The general energy that was there, the specific energy that was pulled out created light. And that specific energy was Chamba, the electron. And it also was Ogun, because it was the crystallization of the electron. Chango is the flowing electron. Ogun is the electron that protects the protons and neutrons. Our whole experience is because of electrons, instead of flowing, at light speed, all through space, these electrons have been trapped, caught, by the proton and neutron, and will not let anything go through its electron cloud, because it's moving at light speed, and it just won't let other electron, other um, atoms move right through it. So, that's Ogun. Ogun means force. Ogun means force. And the reason why I can't break through that is because of Ogun. And the reason why if I was strong enough I could break through that is also because of Ogun. You get what I'm saying? Ogun is force. And that's literally what it means. Ogun means force. Eshu means the force that gathers things into balls. And Alegba means the owner of the vital or primal energy. Because he was the first Orisha to sculpt it. You get what I'm saying? Eshu, in sculpting the primal energy into protons and neutrons, pulled electricity and light apart. But as soon as... Oh no! <laughs> Was that a good? Was that a good? Always. That was a good. <laughs> oh. But a good cannot do anything without a leg rock. We'll get it, we'll get it. You see, Every angel is just like all the energy was one, once one thing. No matter how far you go into one angel's expression, you can find every angel in it. We're all still very much one thing. But what's interesting is the ways we're not. <laughs> um, so, so here we have the first act. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is a shoe. Straight up. Hydrogen's, hydrogen's form is a signature of a shoe. A dot and then a circle going around that dot, concentric circles. That is a signature of a shoe. 
the reason why we know these Orisha is not because they are some anthropomorphic people that we can identify. The reason we know Orisha is because of the signatures they write into the creation that we live in. You get what I'm saying? All right. So you have Eshu and Ogun, and then the other two Orisha that was produced when electricity combined with the um, protons and neutrons to make matter. The other Orisha that were produced was Obatala. And Chango. Alright. Obatala had his let there be light moment which we still have to this day. We call it white noise. White noise, when you used to have the old TVs or on your radio and you were tuned into a channel or the channel wasn't broadcasting, all you get is white noise. That is the earliest Obatala. That is Obatala taking a photograph of his own birth. The, they call it the background relic radiation. So, Obatala suddenly says, let there be light. And that light that Obatala said 14 billion years ago is still circulating around. And every time we move, anywhere we sit, that light is literally dying on our skin, dying on our knives, dying on whatever matter it hits. But there's still enough of it that we can always see. That, that blows my mind. I don't know about y'all, but. Can you that? 14 billion years ago, mm -hmm. Obatala sent out this microwave. Microwaves on a spectrum. Light, sent out this microwave light. But this microwave light, for instance, the people who discovered it were looking for um, 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 cosmic, um, 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 they, they, they had a cosmic radio looking for um, um, that could, I forget what they were looking for, but basically they weren't looking for what they got. They had this very precise, very clean, um, antenna, and they weren't understanding why they were getting a signal from everywhere. The signal was persistent. There's even a joke about them thinking it was on um, bird bombs, so they went out into the antenna and cleaned it. You know what I'm saying? But the fact of the matter is, is that the, this this um, background radiation was predicted by certain physicists who recognized that when light was ripped from electricity, this type of thing could happen. This type of thing is still happening. And that's why I, I keep going back to this, because Ola Kamare is still all there is. E equals MC squared literally means everything is energy. Everything is the vital energy that a link bar is, period. All right? But that vital energy has been spaghettified into many different things on many different spectrums in many different ways. You know what I'm saying? Obatala literally means the owner, O. Anytime you see an O in your O, it means possession. And that's really important because everything I'm talking about is about possession, about being the sole owner of something. So, really, we're all owned by Ola Gamara, literally. You know what I'm saying? So, Obatala is also saying I'm on your ass. <laughs> you know? Obatala is saying I own the cloth that is without a mark on it. I own the fabric 
that has no blemish. I own the fabric that is laid out clean for eternity. And that's not my noise. That's light. Light is this fabric of what? Mare. Energy moving. But of course, because of Einstein, the whole idea of motion becomes a little bit of a question. You see, if mass could move at the speed of light, there would be no time. Period. It is because the components we're made of, which are all traveling at the speed of light, chose to travel in circles instead of a line. That circular motion made them dense enough that they stopped being light and started, stopped being energy and started to be crystallized matter, crystallized light. That's all we are. The electromagnetic spectrum, that's what's going on here. It's all that's going on. You get what I'm saying? So, so, um, Obatala and Chang'o. Chang'o is flowing electricity. Flowing, you see, I have to make it clear, there's a difference between flowing light, which again I said isn't flowing really, because light has no mass. Light has no mass. If you don't have mass, you're really back at singularity. It's only with mass, it's only with a room that things can express themselves. And then light becomes a language between things. And what is using light as that language? Electricity. Electricity flows around the own nucleus and gives all things their characteristic expression and it can produce light when it's extremely heated. It can reflect light and it can absorb light. The original language of matter is light, obatala. However, it is Chang'o that speaks the light. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's the flow of electrons that hears the light and speaks the light. It hears it by absorbing it, changing its characteristics, and it speaks it by its characteristics changing and it expresses that. So, you have Chango, Obatala, Eshu, Okum, Oludumare. Oludumare is, 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 is one Odu, but within the one Odu, there are many Odus. Oludumare owns all Odus, of course. But there are many Odus. We live in a grabbing pot. That's what the Earth is. But let me, I'm getting into a little ahead of myself. Hydrogen. So now you have this incredibly quickly expanding time space where there are these new atoms. Hydrogen, maybe a little deuterium, which is um, hydrogen with um, two. With, with a proton and a neutron, and, and maybe helium in the early beginning. The strong nuclear force is the force that brings protons and neutrons together. That's once again a shoe, a signature, to bring opposites together and make them sit as one, like male and female. Um, so you have this universe where there are basically three different types of elements, three different types of matter. And they are being pulled along 
the wrinkles in time and space that was made by the annihilation of antimatter and matter. They, they being pulled along these convoluted, it's kind of like spider web, um, strings and chains of cool and hot, are dense and vacuous, are whatever contrast you want to make. The, the, the small chain is the dense on the cool part, on the um, vacuousness is the hot, open part, right? The, the hot, open part starts to cool down and the matter starts to heat up. How does the matter heat up? It heats up because it's attracted to each other. That attraction creates the first sexuality, the beginning of sex as a means of creation. What would you call that attraction? Oh, that attraction is always, well, as we go further, it's many different things. But at this point, it's issue. Issue is the only thing. So you have the oh, hydrogen atoms being tied in together. You have oh, 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 nexuses where a whole bunch of them are being tied in together, connecting out to you. You know what I'm saying? In one of those nexuses, enough hydrogen atoms, enough possibly helium, helium is locked away. She, she knows what it is. Um, enough of these atoms get together that the hydrogen collapses into itself and creates the first star. That star is the first, the, the, the light of the first star is the first light after the background realm of radiation. It's the first expression of sexuality. It's the first expression of creativity. It's the first expression of the desire of a community to be more diverse, to have something it doesn't have, to, to come together and make a wall and have an issue. Eshu. I know it sounds like a pun, but Eshu is Eshu. The thing that gathers us into walls are the issues that we have in common. And the issue for the hydrogen was to come together and create a star. And that star exploded in a nuclear furnace created by gravity, and that created the energy necessary for the strong nuclear force for a lake bot to use the strong nuclear force to start making more and more protons and neutrons stick together. Without, without the furnace of the star, a lake bot would not have had the energy to make more protons and more neutrons and more protons and neutrons add on. And each proton and each neutron that a lake bot sealed together created a new element or created a different um, type of the old element, you know, like helium and hydrogen. I mean, deuterium and um, hydrogen. In any case, that went on for a long time, all different types of stars, and basically everything was made up until iron. There was no star that could make any element heavier than iron. Ogum is iron. Simple as that. Ogum is a force and it was a wall. It was a wall preventing matter from becoming more than iron. Iron has certain characteristics. Its characteristics is the idea of making a boundary that we will not pass and then making a force that is possible to pass that boundary. But usually the only way a room can make a force that's powerful enough to pass its own boundary is by brothering up with Chang Lo. And that's what you get when you get a supernova. A supernova is, to me, the deepest expression
expression of trauma. The supernova is the only way you can get any element heavier than iron. So gold, platinum, all the elements that are heavier than iron had to wait until the specific star with the specific mass, with the specific lifetime, with the specific depth that supernovas have. Um, so, now we've got basically about 101 elements, which, you know, as a Yoruba, you know that number, 101. The Yoruba said there's 101 fundamenta, fundamentals. Fundamentals means basically the same thing as elements. Elements. 101 elements. 101 distinct types of matter. Of course, it's a little more than that, but I like the number 101. So let's do that. Um, these elements are everything. And as many as there are, there's only about six of them. Maybe it's seven, eight, nine. All the rest are such trace elements, they hardly even count. That's it. All of life is made up of those, you know, nine elements or something. You know what I'm saying? And I find that interesting because they always talk about there being 101 Orisha. But you know, they never talk about too much more than nine Orisha. You know what I'm saying? And the whole thing about the Yoruba culture is that they are only paying attention to stuff that has something to do with the human condition. They, their whole herbology, when you look at all their herbs, every single herb you can eat it. If you can't eat it, ah, it's not, it's not supposed to be Yoruba. It's not, that's not for you. You know what I'm saying? So of these 101, there's only about nine elements that contributed to life. All the rest said, fuck you. Some said, fuck you so hard that if you have just one atom of them, don't fuck you up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't think all the angels love your asses. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm just saying, you know, the Yoruba were very specific about this. They said, no prayers to all of tomorrow. No altar to all of the mark. That's why the early Christians, in their investigation of the Yoruba culture, thought that the Yoruba were pant, pant, um, um, polytheistic, like, like the um, Greeks. But that's not the case. The fact of the matter is, is that they were monotheistic, but their attitude was that God has nothing to do with nothing because everything's everything. And if you're going to be praying to something, if you're going to be asking something for something, if you're going to be sacrificing something for something, you want something that's going to do what you want and not just do whatever. You know what I'm saying? So it became silly to have any dances for all of the mark, to have any altar for all of the mark, because basically all your dances and everything you do is for all of the mark. Everything you don't want to happen is for all of the mark. You call it evil, Olumari calls it yeah. Um, and you call it good, Olumari calls it yeah. You call it whatever. So it, it really, there's no conversation about Olumari, other than it's a concept that you really have to acknowledge. But beyond that, everything's everything. God's good, all the time. You get what I'm saying? It's a very African-American concept, this, this concept. Because then, like I said, I, I gave you one definition of Olu Damari, a complicated one. A simple translation of Olu Damari is really simple. Good Lord Almighty. Good Lord Almighty. That's it. Another thing they call Olu Damari is Oyigi Yigi Ota. O Yigi Yigi Ota means the immovable rock of ages. 
Why is it movable? Because there's no place to move it to, because it's where <laughs> all movement takes place. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know? So, you have Eshu, Lengba, Ogum, Obatala, Chango, and basically you have um, a whole bunch of Omisha behind that. Um, and I'm going to switch gears at this point and look at this from a Congo perspective. Ile Ife. 
Ile Ife. Ile Ife means the spreading house of love. Love spreads. And to me, that goes right back to the stars. What is it? What, what? They came together as a mound, as a star, to spread love as the elements. And then those elements came together on earth, but basically this idea of spreading life. You know, it is deeply entrenched in every life form on earth to spread. It is, to me, other than sexuality, the most, even before sexuality, because it's an issue of single cell animals. So even before, well, replication is right up there. You cannot spread without replication. But the idea of spreading, fundamental life form. All right, so Obatala spreads it, you have Ile Ife, and then he gets a five-toed pigeon or chicken. Notice the pigeon or chicken has five toes, like it's one of us. And of course, the pigeon or chicken was a dinosaur. You know, he plopped a dinosaur down onto this mound of earth, this, this um, um, continent. And, and the dinosaur kicked the earth all around the world. You know, the chameleon came down and made sure the earth was stable enough for Obatala to walk on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a power, <laughs> you know? Um, and and um, Obatala comes down on his chain, his mare, remember, mare? He comes down on his chain and he starts sculpting because Obatala, Elohim, Jehovah is the potter. He starts sculpting humanity. That's how the Yoruba had. With the Congo, it's a little bit different. The Congo culture is not based on angels. You can make an argument that they have something like angels. And I guess it's a good argument because what I'm calling angels in Europe aren't really angels either. It's just the words. You gotta have some place to get to someplace else. In Europe, the actual word that I'm using for angels, Eshu, Aligba, Ogun, Chanlo, they're called Orisha. Orisha, O to observe, to see. Re means to see, to observe, to experience. Re, O, Re, O, remember, owner. So, so a specific soul, one point of view, one point of view observation. Cha. Y'all know the cha-cha-cha, right? Fun dance, right? It's based on a very deep philosophical concept. To cha, to choose. So you have the owner of perception, owner of observation, chooses. And cha doesn't, you don't just choose once. You choose from the moment you're over to the moment you die. And that's that cha-cha-cha. Each choice taking you along the road. And once you start choosing enough things, enough ways, you can't get to other choices again. If you have two choices in the beginning, and you choose to go this way, and you choose and choose and choose, by the time you're over here, you recognize you'll never know what that other choice would have led you to. And you can know. That's, that's the importance of the cha-cha. Because it tells you that if you get into the cha-cha line, it's only the person in the front of the line that makes the choices as to where you're going to go. That's, that's the real story behind the cha-cha. It's an Alegba story. Mm. You, you get what I'm saying? It's a story of 
I choose, and then everyone behind me chooses until what was an unseen path becomes a road. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What was, no, you could go any which direction, becomes, oh, I have to go this direction because that's where everyone else went. These three steps. Cha cha cha. That's, that's, that's a leg bump. It's also Chang'e and it's Ori Cha in general. Cha Cha is the fundamental philosophy of the Yoruba. It is not just the silly fucking things. You know what I'm saying? All right, these, these, um, so you have Ori Cha in Yoruba, meaning that the owner of observations over time chooses to see these signatures in the reality we all share. You cannot just see origin. You have to make observational choices over time, slowly but surely, to the point at which everything you see is origin. But it takes time, it takes choices. You gotta see what's going on and make comparisons and see the characteristics and compare signatures and see how things interrelate and it takes time to see origin. You know what I'm saying? I call them angels because angels are basically the emanation of God. They're basically forces that come out or come into God or expressed in God. And like I just went through, all of these forces are characteristics that have specific points at which they originate. And their origins count. And the way in which they express themselves up until today counts. Because you are seeing the emotional state of mind of these forces, and you are seeing what those emotional states of mind of those forces might be doing in your life or in the world around you. The Congo have a different concept for the angels. And again, I hate using the word angels or God with the Congo. I feel much more comfortable using them for Europe. Congo is a, it's, it's not a straightforward thing for a European mind to understand Congo. Um, I think you can understand your Yoruba concepts easier. But in Zambi, it's the first ancestor. The first ancestor made of emba, which is white clay, you know, just like, just like, um, just like Obatala, and and you can make an argument that in Zambi is Adam. You can make an argument that in Zambi is Adam. I don't feel too comfortable calling in Zambi Adam because in Zambi. to me is more like a Ludumar. And zombie is the beginning of characteristics. And zombie is the beginning of characteristics because it is all the characteristics that will ever be available. In the beginning, everything that could possibly be was. It just hadn't expressed itself yet. So uh, is that somehow like related to Crossroads? No. no. Um, it's it's crossroads is crossroads is um something that occurs after in zombie. Mm -hmm. In zombie, in zombie is all characteristics at once. The crossroads is a specific characteristic. Yeah, yeah, saying? yeah. I, I I was thinking about that, like like. Before you choose, because you were saying about cha cha, and so I was thinking like. But you're right, because the crossroads, just like in the Yoruba, there is a figure in Congo that is similar. And again, I hate all the. I don't want you to think that any of these are one to one translations. The more mm. you get into it, the more you recognize each one is distinct, each culture has a distinct. Um, philosophy, a distinct feel, a distinct, but it takes time to see that. 
Oh, but Lucero, Lucero is an Mpongo. Mpongo is similar to Orisha. Mpongo are the specific characteristics that were passed down through all things and all life. So again, it's about these characteristics. That's one thing I can say is true for Judeo-Christian culture, Buddhist culture, Hindu culture, um, Yoruba culture. I don't care what worldview you look at. All worldviews are the study of the characteristics that express themselves in reality, are within our minds, which is reality. <laughs> um, Basically, science is the study of characteristics, the study, the observation, the empirical observation of everything that expresses itself. And what does it express? It expresses its characteristics in every way that you can perceive it and in every way that it can affect anything else. So I don't care what religion you're talking about, Look at the characteristics, because the characteristics are signatures. And those signatures, you will find them in every religion, and you'll be able to translate them and use all different types of names for them. However, always keep in mind that just because characteristics are similar at one point in the game, in these early points and these introductory points, the characteristics seem exact. Yeah, of course, the zero is the crossroads, the lake is the crossroads, Christ is the crossroads. But when you get more and more deeper into the rabbit hole, in one direction or the other, those characteristics start to separate and you start having a harder and harder time synchronizing the different cultures. So don't get your cultures twisted. If you're going to study a culture, try to study it well enough to get deep enough into that rabbit hole so you can understand the difference between it and all the other cultures you've studied. You understand what I'm saying? Cool. So, Nzambi, the first ancestor, the white ancestor. Notice Obatala is white. This whiteness is fundamental to just about every culture. Everyone begins with Obatala. Everyone sees Obatala, our Elohim, the creator, our um, Native Americans talk about the sky spirit. Um, um, basically, um, the Aztecs and the Mayans talk about Quetzalcoatl. Water, um, which is Oshumari, but also he was white, white faced and whatnot, and blah, blah, blah. You know, um, regardless of where you go, in the human condition, light is always king, and darkness is either relegated to the secret, the mystery, or to evil. Um, before y'all leave, I can tell y'all about to go. I'd like really quickly to hear from everyone. Um, I want to try to leave it as open as possible, but I want to hear. Um, your comments or questions about what I've shared with you. Cool, we can wear the spot, so you... <laughs> well, you, you put on your jacket, I have to be... Yeah, no, just we, we had to just... We thought it was just so good. Um, so we, um, well, I really appreciate... I really appreciate everything that you're sharing.
trying to put everything together. To it's, easy, it's, it's, it's easy to do right. that because, you know, we all, what is clear for everybody? Right. Um, but I do appreciate, like, honoring that, that they are different. But then also, when you were speaking about the oneness, right? So not to look at everything as separate or everything as one, but understand that we are still, there is a oneness that unifies us all in these studies, right? In different cultures. And also, I just really, I love the way you were breaking down um, the particles, the atoms, all these things in a way that's like tied to scientific concepts of creation. So using, I really like that. That's something that I have in me. I, I tell you, to me, you can synchronize any worldview, and science is the most important worldview to synchronize. Because by synchronizing any religion with science, you get to have an insight as to what those people's, how accurate those people's um, insight into reality was. You know, it's here in this modern age that, you know, we supposedly have all these insights that have given us the ability to do, make all these tools that have never existed before. But what happens when you study somebody's culture, when you study somebody's religion, and you find concepts like Yemoja. Yemoja means the mother of the children of the fishes of the sea. It means that the Yoruba understood that all, all um, life on land, all quadrupeds, you know, on land came from fishes. Well before Darwin, hundreds of years ago, they, they actually would cut their children's faces so that their children's faces would show the gills because they didn't actually put it together that our ears are the remnants of our gills. But nonetheless, they cut the children's faces so that when you return to the ocean, when your soul returned to the ocean, Yemoja would recognize her children. You know what I'm saying? So here you have this concept that we all think was born in the 19th century, but this community had enough insight to have come with, up with it well before the Renaissance. So when you go around to all of these cultures that um, Europeans you know, just chucked away as being primitive, you can now reassess them using the characteristics of science and synchronizing those characteristics with those religions in the same way that the Haitians, um, the, the farm people from Dahomey, when they were born in chains into, ha into Haiti and, and, and looked up in the Catholic Church and saw all of the Catholic saints they didn't see anything that surprised them. They just started looking at the characteristics. Oh, that one has iron all over it. That's all gone. Oh, well, that one has lightning. Chango. Boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? And once you start to understand these characteristics, you can do that with any worldview. And as soon as you're able to do that, you're able to have an insight into how accurately that worldview reflects on what we actually observe and have come to know works. Yeah. You know what I'm and saying? it's important that they're not in opposition, like the science and the spiritual concepts are like fulfilling each other. And well, to me, the only reason why religion would have an issue with science is because science is proving that the religion is far from explaining the observable universe. And that was the reason why the Pope had a problem with Galileo was because Galileo was showing something that undermined the church's arguments, the church's ideas of what the characteristics of reality is. So as soon as you see somebody rejecting science, which is just based on observation, when, as soon as you see somebody rejecting science, you can be sure it's for political reasons, because they do not want to have their worldview dismissed because their worldview does not reflect in the observable data. You know what I'm saying? And that's why I feel this course is so important for culture soldiers.